Let's briefly summarize what we've been talking about in the past few videos. So we were talking about estimating B1, the effect that some variable X1 has on the outcome Y variable. And we talked about what it meant for a variable to be a confounder, a mediator, collinear variable, an independent predictor, or an effect modifier. So let's just remind ourselves of exactly what those were and how we should deal with each of these. And, and I do want to stress that the concepts are the most important. Right? So we talked both conceptually what these are as well as how we can identify them numerically in data. And we want to lean on the concepts more than just purely what's happening numerically. So confounder looked like this where we have some other variable x2, the confounder. That variable is associated with x1. The effect that x1 has on y, that's our question of interest, right? That's what we want to estimate. And we said that if we don't account for x2, x1 and x2's effects are stuck together. We saw that ways we can identify this is that when we adjust for x2, b1 changes, and the standard error of b1 does not increase a lot. Then again, a reminder, the concepts was um, more important than what's happening numerically, but this can help us um, identify that as well or, or numerically verify the way confounders behave. Okay. Mediators were very similar to confounders. They behave the same numerically in a model. Um, the main difference was here we have x1 and x2, the mediator, is on the pathway between x1 and the outcome. So the effect that x1 has on y at least partially goes through x2. Um, and the way that these behave, we said numerically, is the same as confounding, except the only difference is our understanding of the relationship between x1 and x2, that x2 is on the pathway. between x1 and y. Um, I mean, we should note, when building a model to try and estimate the effect of x1 on some outcome y, confounders, we generally want to include these in the model. So if there's a confounder, we're going to want to include it and adjust for it. Mediators, we're usually going to want to exclude these. And as noted earlier, you can read a bit more about the idea of mediation analysis um, to get the idea of if you want to try and estimate the direct effect, the indirect effect, or the total effect. So we're going to lean towards excluding them to estimate the total effect. But you can read a bit more about that if you want. Um, collinear variables, again, are very similar to confounding. We have some variable x2. It's associated with x1. The main difference between collinear and confounding is that these two are so highly associated um, we can't really separate their two effects. So in some sense we can think of x2 as being an alternate measure of x1. And the way we can identify these numerically is that when we adjust for x2, when we include it in the model, b1 may or may not change but what we're going to see is the standard error of B1 is going to increase a lot. Right? And so if X1 and X2 are so highly associated, we get a lot of uncertainty in the estimate of the effect of X1 on the outcome. We'll also see the standard error of uh, B2, right? the standard error for X2's coefficient inflate as well. But B1 is the coefficient we're focusing on. If we have a collinear variable, we want to exclude this. So if some variable essentially is an alternate measure of our variable of interest, we want to make sure we don't put that in the model. Independent predictors we talked about. This is where we want to estimate the effect of x1 on y. There's some other variable x2. It is not associated with x1, but it is another predictor of the outcome. The way we can identify these numerically is um, when we include um, 
x2, b1 should have no real change, but the standard error of b1 will usually decrease. Again, if x2 gives us a better estimate of the outcome, we're going to get a more precise estimate of the effect of x1 on the outcome. So independent predictors, we talked about arguments for including these or excluding these. So to quickly recap that, the reason for including them is it gives us a better estimate of the outcome, gets us a more precise estimate of B1. Um, arguments for excluding them is if they're not confounders, they don't need to be adjusted for, they're not um, distorting B1, right? They're not confounding that effect, they're not biasing it in any way, so we don't necessarily need to adjust for those. And the final thing we talked about was an effect modifier. And this is where we're looking at in the effect of x1 on the outcome y. And there's some other variable x2. It's not on the pathway between x1 and y. But what it does is it changes the effect of x1 on y. So the effect that x1 has on the outcome changes depending on values of x2. So again, what this implies is that B1 is different in the, in the strata or groups formed by X2. So in the groups of X2. And we can test if it's significant. So we can test if it's statistically significant. And again, with these, we said we generally want to include them in the model. If the effect that x1 has on the outcome y changes depending on values of some other variable. Right? So for example, we said if the effectiveness of a drug on some outcome is different for males and females, we want to include that in the model. We want to say, here's the effect for males, here's the effect for females. Right? So effect modifiers, we want to include those in our model. So shortly we're going to start to talk about model building and variable selection and we'll incorporate a lot of these ideas in there when we do that. Stick around guys, there's more to see and please stay safe.